Uh, thank you all for being here today on this January 31st, 2022. I am Nick Kenoki, the Director of Technology for the Asset Leadership Network, and I am very excited for today's roundtable discussion, How Can Asset Leadership Influence Infrastructure Spending? Um, before we get into the discussion, just want to thank our patron members, uh, ABS Quality Evaluations, Definitive Logic, ABS Group, and Onuma System. Uh, we are very appreciative of those members, especially, but for all our organizational members. Uh, as you can see, it's a growing list. And if anyone out there is interested in joining this growing list, uh, please reach out to anyone at the ALN, Mike, myself. Um, there are a number of ways you can get in contact with us, and we would love to talk more about how we can work together. Um, with that, I would just say, if you're out there watching, please participate in the discussion. Send any comments, questions, or feedback to the chat, or use the Q&A function of this Zoom webinar. Uh, and with that, I will introduce Mike Bordenero, Executive Director of the ALN, uh, to give a few more introductions of our esteemed panelists before we get into the actual discussion. Mike? We, we have so many new organizational members that I forgot to keep moving down the slide. So thank you to all our members who uh, are uh, really fueling the activities we're doing, uh, which are expanding this year. And we're very happy that uh, the first round table of the year is featuring very distinguished speakers. I'm gonna very quickly introduce them and then they will all make statements, opening statements, and then Mildred Chua, our newly uh, appointed uh, board member uh, for the ALN, will be leading uh, discussions. And uh, this is going to be very uh, exciting because we're starting off with uh, Amelia Sakoy, who is Assistant Director of Infrastructure for the U.S. Accountability Office. And she sits in on the uh, ISO 55000 uh, discussions on how to improve that uh, very uh, seminal document. Um, David Totman, who is an ALN senior fellow and is active in the American Society of Civil Engineers, where he's a representative to ISO 55000. And he's got so many other hats that he wears, it's, it's hard to list them all, but uh, we appreciate him. Uh, Michael Demers is joining us from uh, Grant Thornton, where he's a director at public policy. Michael uh, has been involved in the Missouri Department of Transportation. So he brings a very uh, interesting perspective on uh, local government approach to uh, upcoming infrastructure spending. Uh, we have uh, Mildred Chua, uh, who I mentioned is a new ALN board member. She's an ALN senior fellow, and she's also the a uh, Institute of Asset Management Global Knowledge Lead. And we're very interested and uh, happy for the relationship we have uh, with the Institute of Asset Management through her and uh, others. Um, uh, Lou Scripps is joining us from Denver where he's the senior manager for uh, asset management at the uh, regional transportation uh, department in the Denver area, which connects Boulder and surrounding areas. Uh, Ian Cranston is pre president of IC Infrastructure. He is also an ISO uh, 55,000 uh, representative. He's uh, based in Canada and will be bringing us uh, insights on what's uh, been successful in Canada. And also he is involved in the Michigan Institute or the Michigan uh, Infrastructure Council. He works with the state of Michigan to help prepare uh, their uh, local government leaders uh, for uh, improved asset management. And all the way from Australia, we have Ben Clark. He's the group manager of assets and infrastructure at Walkerville, which is just uh, the most recent uh, Australian uh, local government where he has uh, brought dramatic improvements uh, through a structured approach to asset management is based in ISO 55000. And again, we've got some very interesting uh, insights from uh, overseas to uh, be sharing in this discussion. So, um, Moving right along to the meat of the uh, uh, discussion, uh, we're gonna have each uh, panelist uh, provide uh, a uh, opening statement. Uh, and we're gonna start with Amelia. Amelia, welcome. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. 
And I'm just going to make a brief statement, and then I look forward to the dialogue and the discussion. Uh, as many of you know, the Infrastructure Act is a huge investment, $550 billion over five years. And uh, you may know that GAO is an oversight agency. So our role will be in overseeing the funds and how they are used. Uh, just briefly, the funding will be across almost all physical infrastructure sectors, roads, bridges, highways, uh, rail transportation, including passenger and freight, public transit, uh, telecommunications, power and grid, and there are other areas as well. But those are areas that the group that I work in at GAO, the physical infrastructure group, those are areas that we oversee. So I wanted to give a sense of what we would be looking at, at the various agencies that are responsible for those funds that will be allocated those funds, which are agencies like DOT, uh, some of the local transit agencies like here in DC, WMATA, the Washington Metropolitan uh, Transit Agency. And uh, tra this includes Traffic Safety, NISTA, and the Federal Highways Administration. What we will be looking at uh, over time, some of our studies, so what we have is what we call mandates. They are required by the act and they're written into the act. We have a total of about 35 mandates that are written into the act. And we will be looking at how the funds are used. So that includes how projects are selected, uh, the justification for the projects, the process for approving the projects, the criteria that are used and things like that just gives you an idea. And then further down the road, after a few years, we also have a requirement to review the effectiveness of these programs. So that means things like, did they accomplish the intended goals? Did they accomplish the outcomes? Various ways of assessing the overall effectiveness of the program. So I just wanted to give you a sense of what GAO as an oversight agency would be looking at in the huge scope of this funding. Excellent, thank you. I uh, look forward to more details um, as the discussion goes on. And then David Totman, um, would you uh, provide your opening statement? Uh, yes, Mike, I, I, I'd, I'd love to. Um, you know, the, the American Society of Civil Engineers, we, we've had a, a long, uh, long history with infrastructure uh, in the United States. And, and I just want to make a, you know, a couple of points about um, really start off with the report card, um, a bit about the IIJA itself or the bill, you know, uh, commentary about our standards and, and really just, you know, asset management best practice. And so um, with respect to the report card, um, you know, we, we just released one in, in, in 2021. So it's still fairly fresh. But if you go back to our last report card in 2017, you really, lots of great content, but you really didn't see the terms asset management, you know, in, in the report card, right? So we, we would talk about life cycle cost analysis and full infrastructure life cycle, but you didn't see specifically, you know, kind of the terms asset management. And in the 2021 uh, report card, it's, you know, virtually every other chapter, um, which, uh, you know, uh, delights me to see that, you know, the American Society of Civil Engineers are really embrace, embracing asset management best practices. Um, I, I dare say 2025, you might even actually see the word asset management plans, uh, you know, in the report card. So um, we're, we're, we're becoming a lot more uh, conversant uh, in asset management best practice. And uh, with respect to the bill, uh, the, the, the IIJA, um, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, actually, if we have this conversation in a couple of weeks, um, you know, next, uh, the, the first week of March um, is really our, the ASC legislative fly-in. So members from all over the United States will be flying into DC and we'll have a chance to 
actually work directly with some of the uh, congressional members to, to kind of uh, help, you know, work on, on some of the implementation and execution components. Um, you know, we've, we've been strong proponents of, of supporting kind of funding over financing because we know a lot of the smaller systems are, you know, will be challenged. Um, we're going to, you know, fund, funnel a lot of the funding through SRF, which is great. It's an existing program. We can expedite the funding to get it to the people who need it. But the points that Amelia would made are perfect, are on, on point, right, of how do we prioritize these projects? How do we you know, select the appropriate projects? How are we going to execute them? How do we measure success? Um, right. So that's, uh, you know, and, and we're very much promote a, a holistic infrastructure management. We know a lot of the funding is, you know, there's funding for transportation, funding for water, funding for telco, separate buckets, and we're not allowed to mix cost centers. But we realize, you know, we kind of need to take a holistic infrastructure approach when it comes to uh, rebuilding some of these communities. Um, you know, and, and in that, um, you know, ASCE, we're very much about um, many of our standards. Um, you know, again, we've been working with infrastructure for quite some time. Um, so, you know, uh, standards like ASCE 7, which talks about, you know, uh, prepares you for hazards. Uh, 24 was about flood, uh, ASCE standard 41 on seismic, um, and really our whole manual practice 140 on, on resiliency. You know, and, and this this all goes with a lot of the manuals that are out there with American Water Works Association, American Public Works Association, lots of, of, of great content out there, but trying to use these standards to help kind of fortify your asset management, you know, best practice. Um, and, and I think from an ISO 55,000 perspective, what we're really seeing, you know, is, is this conversation, and I think it goes back to one of our ALN members, you know, Jack Dempsey, that managing assets versus asset management and, and, you know, standards get into managing assets and how to take care of infrastructure, but it's really the asset management theory, the best practice um, that, that we in the U.S., quite frankly, are coming up to speed and our, our neighbors uh, are, are much better uh, conversant in, you know, those practices. And we'll hear more from Ben and Ian, I'm sure. Um, but really, you know, this is a great time within 55,000, especially with some of the updates um, where we're looking at revamping 55,000 and 55,001 and spending a lot more time on the definitions of, you know, value and risk, right? So it's, it's a really good time to be having these conversations about, you know, the infrastructure bill and what asset management means, um, you know, for these projects. And of course, we want to bring it to the asset leadership level. Uh, you mentioned the managing assets versus asset management. And one way that uh, I remember uh, Lindsay uh, Ziegler from uh, Andrew James Advisory Group said, it's moving from engineers to managers. And it's the leadership from the management side that the ALN is focused on. And that's what we think is important to be guiding and driving in this uh, rule and regulation formation period. So thank you, David. And we want to talk about how we can be involved in, in anything you're doing there. And uh, Lou Cripps, is, uh, this is our first time meeting. So I apologize that uh, I had your name wrong. I just want to show you that uh, I did uh, correct it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so uh, Lou uh, comes to us uh, through his connection with uh, Mildred. And uh, uh, will you please let us know how you're seeing the, uh, the, uh, the bill and maybe lessons learned from past um, infusions of money from the federal government? Yeah, so thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, no problem. I, um, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna talk strictly from the kind of public transit lens here um, for us. Um, the infrastructure bill is actually kind of evidence of uh, a problem that exists, which is we're not really um, managing our infrastructure well. By, by getting into a place where we needed this infusion of funds to be able to bring things back into um, good condition says that we've not been good stewards of these assets over time. Um, so 
and, and it's sort of interesting to, to us that the bill itself doesn't really use or embody some of those principles of asset management. There's still an emphasis, there's still a bit of an emphasis on kind of shiny new things, modernization, and, and there's really that mix in there that can be a little bit confusing. So to bring this to a specific kind of um, transit example, um, in transit, we actually have the transit asset management plan. It's a requirement that was put into place in MAP 21 that, that we have to have a plan. So when we're talking about this next 12 months, um, our next 12 months has already been programmed, right? It's, it's in our plan. So um, for us, what we did, um, everyone knows COVID uh, was heavily impacted public transit. Um, our ridership and our, our user base um, shifted quickly. Um, but what we had is a plan where we had looked at kind of best case, uh, worst case, and where we hope to be. Now, when this infrastructure funding and even the CARES and the CARISA Act money came into the organization, we were able to just go to our list in our asset management plan and say, the next projects to be funded are this. So it, the only thing that changed was our constraints. It didn't actually change our organizational objectives or targets. So um, that, that changed a lot of things for us. But again, I'm just gonna bring this, my viewpoint from public transit. Uh, a lot of people, when they think public transit, they think very, you know, very, they've got some buses and they run around town. Uh, but what we, we do serve about 2,300 square miles. Um, we've got about 1,200 buses. Um, we've got 122 miles of rail, um, 234 light rail vehicles and 66 commuter rail. And we have dozens of facilities and public facilities and, and a police department and all kinds of things. So when that funding came in, our ability to look at our plan and say, what is it that we have planned and then not be reactive, but to be very focused on, um, so I see the question here, Can, Mike, do you mind if I answer it? So the term shovel ready projects, um, that's, we have, we have a renewal and replacement schedule and that includes some deliverability pieces. Um, we don't really look at it as shovel ready. We look at it as um, this section of track is scheduled for renewal replacement. Um, and those things are just programmed into our plan. So the transit asset management plan requirement from the federal government stitches perfectly into, um, into the, the infrastructure, the new IIJA bill, which is we had this plan. So we had these projects that were prioritized and then we had money that came into the agency and then we just had to line those up. Um, there's a, of course some other some other things to it, but that's that's really in practice what we did. We said, this is the worst case. Then we had extra money. We just went back to this list of prioritized projects and plugged those in um, because for us, it takes a long time to get projects delivered. Hopefully that uh, kind of gives people a little bit of a picture of RTD and public transit and how we're how we're implementing this, this funding. And uh, Lou, it also gives uh, the uh, it supports what we heard from uh, Chris Vick at the Bureau of Land Management at our annual event uh, last fall, where they had $3.2 billion worth of maintenance plans. And when legislation came to them and said, what do you have? They were able to give a very organized plan. And when the infrastructure bill was passed, all of their funding was approved because they had it in an organized structured approach and it was trusted, they were trusted to be able to do something with it. So you just reemphasize how important it is to have those plans in place. And MAP 21 was the predecessor in using an ISO 55,000 approach to asset management plans. And uh, we're gonna be hearing from, uh, why don't we go to uh, Michael Demirs now? Michael's joining us from uh, on the phone, Michael. Hi, yes. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you guys, at least virtually. I'm joining by phone today. I had a little bit of technical difficulty on Zoom, unfortunately. Um, but uh, my name is Michael Demers. I'm about 17 years in the state DOT space. I'm currently at a company called Grant Thornton. 
uh, serving state DOTs as well as federal U.S. DOT clients, such as Federal Highway, Federal Transit Authority. Um, throughout the last 17 years that I've spent as a consultant and leader in the public sector, I should say a little bit, I, I, I was formerly a division director, a member of the executive management team at Missouri DOT. And prior to that, I was working for the planning director at Arizona DOT. So I've had sort of a varied experience on both sides of the table, both as a public sector person and as a consultant serving transportation asset management clients. Uh, as you guys have all covered in, in your introductions, we've seen an increasing shift from uh, in the capital program delivery space from an emphasis on building new things or modernizing and using, you know, vehicle to infrastructure or vehicle to vehicle technologies, increasingly focused on taking care of what we have now. I think a lot of states are waking up. The 2020 census was sort of a shock to many people that don't really follow demographic and birth birth rate uh, trend lines that a lot of places that we currently didn't really think of as shrinking. And as a state DOT, our, our main revenue source is based on the gasoline tax, which is based on how many people there are driving cars, what the cars are as a mode share. Uh, started to do some uh, pretty decent revenue forecasting based on how many people are around driving now, how many people are going to retire in the next three to four years. And uh, localities that had prior prior to the last couple of years really been focused on building new things, they're really starting to wake up and realize how do we get serious about taking care of what we have because we're going into a period where IIJA notwithstanding, looking at the state level resources that we have, it might be somewhat difficult if we don't start shifting our organizational culture and our focus now. So what I work on at Grant Thornton is uh, providing state DOT and federal uh, federal DOT clients, including local transit agencies or really any transportation agency, providing them with the data and analytics to really understand what's happening in their organization, what's happening with the condition and performance of their infrastructure, but also sometimes even just as importantly, what's happening organizationally that's really preventing them from sustaining an asset management culture and delivering on that asset management vision. Uh, luckily, as it's been mentioned, MAP 21 required uh, transit and state DOTs to have asset management plans, a lot of places look at that as almost like a check-the-box effort. We work with clients that really want to go beyond compliance and really integrate it into their culture and their processes. And that's kind of an overview of what I do and what Grant Thornton does. And it's great to be with you guys today. Thank you. Michael, thank you for that. And that is part of the ALN mission is to advance the culture beyond compliance to help people understand the great value that they can unleash if they have a structured approach to asset management. And Michael, you had uh, uh, informed me about other legislation that includes asset management plan. And during the discussion, I hope uh, you're able to bring that up. Yes, thank you. Okay. Ian Cranston from Canada is working with Canadian organizations, but also with uh, the U.S., the, the Michigan Infrastructure Council. Ian? Nice, great to be here, Mike. Thanks very much for the invite. Uh, yeah, so I'm really passionate about helping build knowledge and awareness and capacity on asset management, mainly for public infrastructure owners, uh, enabling them to do more themselves. So that's a real big, uh, big passion of ours is helping build that capacity and skill base. There's groups in Canada, like the Canadian Network of Asset Managers, who's really been pushing asset management and awareness, um, much like ALN is doing in the US, which is great. Uh, over the years, they've developed a number of resources. One of them that we were involved in is this booklet. So it's the AM 101 for communities, trying to get local governments excited about asset management. That's a free download that you can get on the CNAM website. Uh, we can put a link in the chat somewhere. But you know, over the last few years in Canada, we've seen a real kind of surge in asset management awareness and understanding um, amongst local governments and public infrastructure owners. But what that's, what that's caused is this surge in demand for asset management staff, people going out and managing to get you know, a, a position uh, in their budget for a, you know, an asset management coordinator, an asset management manager, then they're going out and trying to hire them and discovering that they're like hen's teeth. They're pretty hard to find. So uh, you know, what can we do as an industry to try and um, try and put more, more people out there so that there are these staff available? And this isn't just affecting local government and public infrastructure owners, but the consultants are also struggling to hire people um, and also private companies as well. Private infrastructure owners are all competing for this pretty limited pool of, of resources that's out there. And a lot of these organizations are realizing that we have to start trying to build this capacity ourselves. 
You know, it's not, it's not possible to go and hire someone with 10 years asset management experience. Um, what do we need to do as an organization to try and equip ourselves to deal with these staffing challenges and position ourselves for long-term success so that we can have the right skills that we need? Uh, there was another initiative that we were involved with, with the Canadian Network of Asset Managers, which was developing this competency framework for communities. So looking at the underlying skills that an organization needs to be, to be good at asset management. Uh, very kind of public focused in terms of local governments and communities and what uh, the skills are that they need to do. Uh, and that was a really exciting project that involved uh, GFOA, the IAM, IPWA were all involved. Uh, and that's a, a resource, again, it's free to download from the CNAM website. Um, now in the US, you know, lots of these asset management issues are, are starting to come to light. And it's great that there's these discussions happening now um, where we're talking about, you know, the impacts of this and what we can do to move forward and increase spending. Um, but my kind of question to, to, to all of us is how do we resource that? You know, how do we make sure there's enough asset management people to help organizations go down this road of making better decisions using the information that they have? Uh, because a lot of public infrastructure owners, they're, they're already struggling. We're already stretched. We're already, off, you know, trying to do so many things off the sides and corners of our desk. You know, how do we make sure that we can, we can staff this? Now, in the infrastructure bill, there's a whole section on state human capital plans, which is excellent to see that we've been thinking about this and, it, and it's there. Um, my kind of, when first kind of read of that, I'm thinking it's more around, you know, how do we make sure there's enough engineers and construction staff and resources at that, that level to get the capital projects delivered? But my question would be, has there been any thought given to asset management professionals? And how do we make sure that these organizations are, you know, equipping themselves so that we have the right asset management knowledge so that, yeah, the money's coming in, we're spending the time making sure that the money's going in the right places. Uh, and that's something that, is, as Mike mentioned, you know, we've been working with the Michigan Infrastructure Council um, all around their asset management uh, program. So the, uh, the MIC, uh, as a, a division under the Treasury Department of the state of Michigan, have been doing a lot of great work over the last few years uh, to try and build this culture of asset management across the state. And uh, it's been super exciting. So it started off as an awareness course that was put together uh, and that was um, all around how, you know, these regional reps that are there representing the state, how can we give them some of the materials that they need to start having the asset management conversations. They also developed uh, asset management readiness scale. So it's a very basic maturity assessment that can be delivered. Um, and that's a free download again from the MIC website um, that I can share with you. But the latest thing that they've put together is this champion program. So this is a, a kind of real hands-on, uh, immersive uh, training program that infrastructure owners across the state of Michigan are going through. It's a three month program where they go and really get kind of hands on, they get some e-learning, they then have some live discussion pods. Uh, and really like the, the intent of it is to try and get people across the state of Michigan that are in these infrastructure owning positions, having them become these champions for asset management so they can start having the conversations within their organization and really start to sow these seeds and build this network for an asset management culture across the, uh, across the state. So that's been super exciting there. Excellent. Um, yeah. That's it. Um, you're gonna say something else, but you'll be able to throw that in during the discussion. So I, I'm glad that Ian and Michael both mentioned uh, culture and that's so important and we hope to be uh, uh, changing that. Um, and Ben from Australia, thanks for getting up early to join us. No worries. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I guess for me, it's going to be providing sort of that Australian sort of lens on what I see is happening in the US. So the last ASCII report, I think, had the infrastructure deficit at around $2.9 trillion, which had gone up a half a trillion dollars since the last ASCII report. So that's the greatest challenge facing everyone is that infrastructure deficit. I think the average infrastructure in that report was about a C minus. So what, what that provides is a huge opportunity um, to bring this infrastructure up to say a B minus or at least a better quality than what it is now. Um, and how can we do that without raising taxes or printing more money? So we do that by understanding the state of our assets and spending money like we do in Australia using optimization science. And that's been done around Australia um, for, for years now, that's that strategic asset management approach. Um, so using data and science and the optimization logic to spend the money so that 
in five, 10, 20 years time, there's actually less assets in red, so in poor condition. So they've got better bridges, better roads, and ultimately the infrastructure deficit actually scales down rather than continues to creep up. Um, so, and that's done by where we're spending money in the right place at the right time rather than just building new. So from an Australian perspective, I'd love to see the $1.9 trillion funding um, be directed to smarter asset management, not just building shiny new things. But and so through that though, you need, as we mentioned previously, there needs to be education of, of staff so they understand what asset management is, how to do it properly, and really shifting that lens from a really short-term, what's happening in the next couple of years or immediately to what's our infrastructure going to look at over 20 years. So Australia, we've got legislation that requires us to have a minimum 10-year asset management plan. And we've recently been provided through COVID stimulus funding, similar to what's happening just at a smaller scale. But a lot of that was focused and requirements said that we had to spend it on assets that are identified in our asset management plans. So it limited the scope of spending to try and ensure that we weren't going to have a huge stimulus um, funding pool come through. And then in 20 years, the next generation is trying to pay for what was spent now by building all these brand new things. It was actually spent to lower the burden on those future generations, which you know, it means that we've got more time to plan and do the right things. Um, I will just touch on the shovel ready comment that I saw earlier. So in Australia, some of our grant funding is um, required to be what they call shovel ready. And so we're able to do that because our asset management plans have set our next 10 to 20 years worth of um, renewal and replacements. And so we can start to design those in advance, ready for um, construction the following year or in the following two or three years. So when this funding comes through, we've actually already got our designs, our plans in place. So as our, I guess, true shovel ready, all we do, we take that funding, go to tender, and then we can build them. So as mentioned, I really hope that some of that funding can be spent, that you guys are gonna to receive to be spent on training staff and providing that great education so the, the money and communities can be benefited from it down the line. Excellent, thank you, Ben. So two, two main things from that, uh, both you and Ian mentioned training and the ALN has the A55K professional certification to help people understand ISO 55000 thoroughly. And uh, the second thing I wanna say is, did you hear that United States, a 10 year asset management plan? Um, uh, we need to work with you, Ben, more to find out how we can bring the, the message from Australia to here. But thank you for joining us today and I look forward to further comments uh, about that. Mildred, that's a lot of uh, comments and statements to digest. That's Go right, right ahead. That's right. So thank you very much. I want to respond to all the statements that were made. Um, but first of all, from my own perspective, I mean, asset management is about making really good decisions, right? And achieving your desired outcomes, right? And that's where leadership comes in because that's really what they care about. They wanna be able to make the right decision. They want all the outcomes that you promised them from the very beginning to be achieved. Now, there are many challenges to that, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through like a few things that I have picked up on, on the comments from, from, from the panelists. Um, first of all, Amelia talked talked about um, a process for prioritizing uh, investments, a process also not just when you select the project, uh, understanding whether you achieve the outcomes in the end. And, and the frameworks that are in place right now for understanding whether you achieve the outcome or not is, is an area of performance management where you um, we, we need to start looking into like, how can we put some of those tools in place that would help us assess that? Because from a financial perspective, um, we, we put the money, we make the investments, but then we never really truly understand. And I know that coming from my own personal experience now, I came from New York MTA. My experience over there is that we were very good at pushing out projects and achieving you know, large capital programs and putting those in place, but not really truly understanding whether um, we saved money, whether it was truly resilient or as resilient as we had hoped it would be, um, th those assets. So I think that is the one thing when Amelia mentioned that is, is that something that is a question that we could talk about? Um, 
what do we have in place that that would put something like that in, you know, together in terms of a framework um, that would allow us to, to assess performance uh, of the outcomes, right? Um, the second thing I wanted to address was um, David had mentioned that, you know, the, the report cards, right? How it's evolved over time and now there's more mention of asset management. And I truly agree with that because as someone who came from a public transit agency, the agencies have been evolving as well in developing these plans and getting better and better at at it. I mean, I think Lou, Lou described the process from Denver. Um, MTA is similar in terms of really becoming more and more adept to, to really um, understanding the need for these plans and doing a good planning process. But the focus in general <laughs> always is on capital. Any organization is, is always saying, here's my five-year capital plan, billions of dollars that they put out. And you know, um, the maintenance planning aspect of it always seems to kind of be taking a back step, right? And so the holistic perspective um, is something that needs to be encouraged more and more, even put into requirements that not only are you able to demonstrate that this capital project is gonna achieve X, what is the impact on maintenance and operations over the life of that asset? Because um, there are many surprises that happen. You put in a brand new shiny thing, and then all of a sudden it's done, it's implemented, everybody moves on to the next build, and here maintenance and operations is struggling. They don't have the capabilities, they don't have the systems, they don't quite understand you know, how that asset fits into all their operational plans. I mean, there's, there's a lot of those issues that I know personally, and we've encountered as we've been working closely um, with maintenance and operations folks versus the capital planning folks. So I, I wanted to, to just throw that out there that I think um, it would be great to see um, asset management planning to become more and more holistic that really focuses on both sides and the balance of CapEx and OpEx is so key. Um, I come from a finance perspective. I was formerly CFO of one of the operating agencies for the MTA. And so that was my, that was my focus when I sponsored the asset management program is to understand the outcomes, the cost of those outcomes initially as an investment. And of course, moving forward, what's it gonna cost us to maintain that so that it's built for the future and it's resilient, sustainable um, for years to come. So um, I wanted to start off then by just talking about um, asset leadership and where that really, I mean, I think it addresses, it's very much needed, right? You need sponsorship at the, um, at the leadership level. Um, what, what do we say to our executives? I mean, how do we get them to buy in? Because they know what they want. They want outcomes, right? and they want better decisions. But then everything you have to put in place from people, process, technology, and data is, is, is big, right? And it has to be all integrated. So starting with you know, people, like how do we get the culture of our organizations to move forward? I mean, I think we could start having that discussion so that that, that culture, which includes your leadership, having a strong sponsorship for for asset management. Lou, will you address that from uh, your perspective in Denver? You're on mute. Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's certainly a challenging question. Um, one of the ways that we're trying to address it here in, in Denver is to really think about this as, what do you want your legacy to be? And I think that has to be the message that we take forward to leadership because, um, uh, uh, ben mentioned this longer time horizon. Um, strategic asset management is about that decision making and longer time horizon. So we have to we have to message to CEOs what would they like their legacy to be, and then once they're able to clearly articulate what their what their legacy, what their desire is to have, um, then we can help we can help deliver that. Um, frankly. Um, asset management principles, um, oftentimes um, they exceed the lifespan of the CEO, but the projects, the, to, to Mildred's point, these projects that get delivered are coming with these intergenerational liabilities. We're delivering things that have a burden that go much further into the future. So it has to be, what do you want your legacy to be? 
did you build a bunch of things that you can't sustain? Um, it's this question of, and then what? We did something and what were the trade-offs? What did the cost? Could we maintain it? So uh, our message has been, um, our, our message has been that it has to be what they want their legacy to be. And then our job is to try and deliver it. It's, it's, uh, it's a philosophy. And um, I wish I could say we were better at it. And, and Mildred mentioned that she was a, a financial officer. Ian, uh, the Michigan Infrastructure Council is under the Department of Treasury. We're finding that it is the power of the purse that is affecting the culture and the uh, impact on uh, this long-term approach to asset management. Uh, can you comment on what you've seen about uh, getting a culture at leadership level? Yeah, so certainly for, for Michigan, it's been really powerful for them in terms of having this driven by the by the Treasury Department. Um, and, you know, like there's a lot of people in the Treasury Department that are also seeing firsthand the challenges that infrastructure owners around the state are having. And, you know, they can see that, you know, asset management is a great way to, to help these, these places out and, and help them move forward in a more sustainable way. Um, so it's a kind of double benefit for them in terms of being able to, uh, to really help like a lot of the infrastructure owners around the place. And, and certainly in Canada, like it's, it, you know, reasonably consistently, we see it being pushed um, from the finance side in organizations. Um, yes, you know, everyone plays a part in this and, you know, no one department can do it all. Uh, but certainly having the finance people on your side uh, in terms of helping uh, bang that drum is, is a really, really powerful, uh, powerful, powerful position. Um, I, I agree with that, um, but at the same time, a lot of managed asset management programs are also not driven uh, at the finance level. And then what you often find is that the financial folks don't understand, right? You know, you have to spend $100 million on this program over the next five years, right, to put in place, you know, better asset management. They're like, okay, what's my return on investment on that? And I think, um, you know, a lot of people struggle to, to present that business case for asset management at the leadership level and also at the financial level, right? Because you have to boil it down really to dollars and cents. And a lot of the benefits for asset management really is, is, is long range, right? Because it's over a long period of time. So you may be the person that implemented it, but you won't see it for another five to 10 years. And all of a sudden you have better data and you make better decisions. And the value of those better decisions, you don't realize it until much, much later. And so that's, that is such a big um, challenge Challenge. And it, it was very challenging, I know, for me when, when, when I was still um, in New York, is, is to always present every project in the improvement program for asset management, how much is that going to save us? And whether it was five years or 10 years later and outlives whoever was there, um, it, at least there was documentation um, of this is what we expect okay, as a return on investment. And I think that communication just needs to be strengthened a lot more um, because if, if it's not done, you'll have your CFO basically saying no or cutting the budget when, you know, it's better not to have a budget at all sometimes rather than getting some seed money because then you can't do much with it, right? Um, which leads me, by the way, to, um, <laughs> it leads me to a conversation that Ian and I had had separately on, and I've seen some comments on the chat about training and, and can the infrastructure funding pay for training in asset mm -hmm. management? I've, we've had grants through MAP21 that actually has paid in New York for asset management training. Um, so I, that is a very good question. Somebody threw that out there and I, I wanted to ask that out. Um, I see some hands up then and, and in. So very quickly, I have scanned the uh, bill and there is not the explicit training funding that I had hoped that MAP21 has, but I do think it's possible for the next couple months to uh, put in rules or regulation that does that and we want to try to influence that. And I had a conversation with Ben yesterday about this and Ben is actually serving uh, municipalities of uh, different size where asset management is just as important. So Ben, can you uh, address this issue of, uh, it's, it's a, a couple issues going at once now, uh, leadership and getting the right culture at leadership, 
uh, the importance of training and uh, basically whatever uh, experience you have from Australia that you might think uh, helps the US. Yeah, so I'll just touch on the, the leadership side. So what I've found, um, obviously having it legislated helps, but in saying that, what we look to do, when we put up, so particularly our elected bodies who obviously have the, the final say in Australia on how much money we're gonna to have to spend on what, getting them to look at a five-year um, works plan and renewal program at a minimum, they're only in, they're elected for four years. So by putting that fifth year in, it's actually forcing them to think about, okay, if I'm re-elected, are the decision I'm making now going to be mean that I can't do something in my next term? So by making them think further than just their, their current elected period forces them to really think about, are we spending the money in the right place? Um, the importance of training um, to get those real, uh, I guess, fundamentals right, enable, will it help sort of twofold? So it helps the staff know what they need to do and the people um, on the ground, but it also enables them to be able to tell the story to the leadership. So, you know, if you've got, you need to have a, a bottom up approach, but also to sort of force the issue, but then you need the, obviously the leaders to then take over and start to, to drive that back down. So with uh, part of our, um, we're for elected bodies, uh, when they're new, newly elected, they have to go through an asset management um, intro course as a part of their, their um, sort of introduction to local government. Um, and then we do a refresher every four years. So the ones that have been on for a number of years get a refresher and any new ones are sort of educated and we'll do a presentation to them around what our organization, where we're at with asset management, where we're trying to go. Um, just touching on a few, the return on investment, I've through some um, strategic asset management optimization um, in my current um, role, we're a very small um, organization. We've got about $2 million capital budget. I've managed to doing through optimization, we've saved about $300,000 a year on our roads infrastructure spend um, in renewal. So what that meant is we can now spend that 300,000 somewhere else. So rather than give it back, we can then invest that into our buildings or our other assets that don't necessarily have enough funding. And that scales up. I've been at an organization where we saved about a million dollars a year on our roads. Um, and the reason I use roads as an example is generally speaking, they're the ones that have the best asset data when you start. Everyone knows where their roads are. Everyone understands their roads, how they degrade. So they're often the easiest asset um, to start with. And then you branch out to other ones. And Ben, will you tell uh, the percentage that that 300,000 and the million are? Because it doesn't seem like much, but when you understand it in terms of percentage, it's powerful. So if I look at the overall capital budget, it was about 20% oh, of the 300,000, about 20%. But if I look at it just on my roads, it was about 35% of my capital budget, but I was able to, to reinvest somewhere else. So it's a fairly significant amount and that and that scales up so the more you've got to spend if you spend in the right place at the right time you can actually unlock hidden capital without having to go and ask for more money from either your communities increasing taxes or you don't have to print more money you don't have to go take out more loans you can do it within the existing budgets excellent thank you um uh, david you my apologies you've had your hand up for a while uh yeah uh thank you you know I, Mildred, I just wanted to comment a little bit about what you know Ian was saying, and and I think I'm I'm going to ask Lou to to maybe uh, confirm uh, you know the my my speculation here, but it's one of the things you know with with uh, ASCE, um, we're, you know we're all about civil engineering, but there's there's nine technical institutes that that then you specialize whether you're mechanical, civil, or structural. And, and the latest institute of which I had the honor of being president of is the Utility Engineering and Surveying Institute. And, and what we found were, and especially at my, my old alma mater, Colorado Springs Utilities, um, you know, it, it took us a while to take a really good civil engineer to make them a utility engineer. Because, you know, and, and Lou, I'm sure in transportation, you know, if you had an asphalt design engineer, you know, they they got to learn a lot at RTD, right? There's a lot of business, you know, that goes on in the public, right? And so, 
um, you know, understanding rates, understanding, uh, you know, the, the human aspect. And, and that's really what we're looking at when we look at the IIJA as well. There's that large chunk in water, you know, funding for lead service line replacement in disadvantaged communities, right? And so understanding, you know, what we're trying to do today's, you know, UESI or, or today's civil engineer, yeah, you, you may be a pipe design engineer, but you got to be the accountant. You got to be almost the lawyer. You have to be the PR person. You have to understand holistics, right? You have to understand what the value is to the organization. You know, and Mildred, your comment about, you know, the CFO and, and this ROI, that's a pure kind of financial thing. And, and what we're having to do today is, as, as engineers is look at risk. Right, we, we're trying to understand asset value and mitigation of risk, and there's right. goes beyond just dollars that right. a CFO may be looking at. And so, uh, you know, right. to Ian's point, I agree. Training, you know, asset management, but you know, at ASE, we're trying to, you know, create the next generation of civil engineers of don't just focus on your one thing. You know, you need to look at a holistic community and how public infrastructure you know, promotes even public health, public policy, all of those things. It's a tall order, but, you know, we're trying to move the needle on getting our next generation civil engineers prepared for this kind of business environment. Yeah, I, and I want to add to that, David, thank you. Um, you mentioned risk, valuing risk, right? Because again, from a financial perspective, you know, everything has to be translated to dollars, but then sometimes the social benefits and valuing risk, I mean, that's far greater. You, sometimes we make this statement like it's not quantifiable, but it's significant, the impact of it. And therefore it is documented and it, it does carry weight in an investment justification, right? To say that there is it, it, you know, big risk associated with if we do not do this, this project, right? Um, I, I know I've, I've done that as, as I have put together the frameworks when we were evaluating projects, I always left room for societal benefits and risk. And if it could not be quantified, at least it was stated, um, especially on the safety side, where it's very hard to say, okay, you know, a lot of people are going to die if the bridge collapses or something like that, right? How do you value the human life? And, and all of that is enough of a statement to say that safety, right? That there's a safety risk uh, associated with it. So I wanted to just say that as well, that um, there needs to be more sort of understanding <laughs> from, from, from maybe the financial perspective um, to accept those um, statements as well as part of, of, of justifying your investments. And I know that I have because it was, it was difficult. It was very challenging to say just based on the dollars, whether it was a go, no go. Um, I, I think that leads to, uh, Amelia had sent something on the notes here. Um, you want to talk about prioritization um, so I think I see your hand up, Amelia. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, I wanted to respond on the leadership, but then uh, there was also, I saw a chat going on about setting priorities, but if I could quickly respond on the leadership question, um, we did a study where we established an asset management framework. Some of you are familiar with a couple of years ago. And what we found is that it, it really can't be just top down uh, because what happens, as someone said, is when the, if it's just top down uh, in the federal government, at least, you know, the, the head of an agency is appointed and serves a term of four years or perhaps longer, but not long. So it, so, and we've seen that happen with really dynamic people like Thad Allen at the Coast Guard. And when the person leaves, uh, it may not be sustained. So it has to be, it may be initiated at the top, but it really has to be ingrained. And it's really at the middle level, at the management level where it gets implemented and instituted. And then of course, it has to be throughout the agency or you know, I'm talking about the government, but I just wanted to make that point. Um, if we could, uh, shift to uh, prioritization. I wanted to comment because I saw several comments in the chat about setting priorities and uh, the issue of, you know, shovel ready or shiny new things. Uh, that I think is really important. 
and something that we um, I'm currently doing a study on deferred maintenance and looking at you know huge and Ben made the point in Australia about the huge amount of deferred maintenance and just to give an example uh, from the Infrastructure Act uh, the Coast Guard is receiving seven billion dollars uh, six billion of which is for projects that have been deferred. So I think that's a really good example. Um, and we did a report that was issued in September, which I spoke about at the ALN conference back in November. We did a report on resilience to climate change and natural disasters. One of the agencies we studied was the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard has developed a risk assessment tool for looking at flood management, sea level change, but it hasn't been fully implemented. So part of this $6 billion is to fully implement uh, this tool uh, and continue its risk assessments of uh, the risk for flooding. But that's just part of it. In addition, uh, the remainder of the 6 billion will be for projects that have gone unfunded. However, it's so important to look at how those decisions are made in terms of which ones will be funded, how they are prioritized, what are the criteria that will be used. And the reason I use this example is that climate change is now a big priority of the current administration, but you still need to be very careful about how you select them and how you go about them, how you will, you know, what metrics you will use, how you will measure the success. And I just wanted to make that point because I saw many comments there. Um, deferred maintenance is, is a huge, huge issue in the federal government and, you know, obviously around the world as, as Ben noted in Australia. Michael Demers has been uh, very patient. Uh, we'd like him to chime in. Uh, Michael, what comments do you have at this point? Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed listening to hear all the perspectives, both from uh, basically all over the world. So uh, having worked for a number of DOGs interpreting and implementing federal guidance at the state level, I can tell you that most states are largely implementing uh, basically at compliance level. Now, generally out of the 50 states, you'll probably get maybe five or six that are doing a really great job at implementing this this process and these values into their culture. Uh, maybe one or two are really strong on the data and the performance, uh, condition and performance analytics. Um, you mentioned before, Mike, uh, you wanted to hear basically about the sort of evolution of the at the policy level. You know, MAP 21, which was, I believe, 2012 was the year MAP 21 came out, was really the first to get uh, performance management and therefore assets management uh, on the radar of state DOTs because even 2011 and before that, most states were still kind of in this political culture to DOT where the function of the DOT is to build new highways and to build new bridges or to build more lane capacity. And that's kind of how the DOT works, you know, depending on how the appointment structure works, usually those people are the ones that, uh, you know, come from the co contracting industry and they get placed there and it's their mandate to build new things. So as we see on the asset management side, the professionalization of assets management is a discipline in the United States and increasingly moving it beyond, you know, just sort of a subsector of engineering. We're also seeing state DOTs move the needle a little bit too. And that's being helped by federal uh, legislation, uh, the FAST Act in December 2015, and a number of what they call NPRM, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking and Rulemaking Processes, where state DOTs and other um, private sector actors got to comment on this proposed rulemaking and the guidance that's issued by Federal Highway for the performance measures and the asset management plans and its FTA, similar NPRM process. I would encourage everybody, just monitor the Federal Register and monitor the agencies that impact the modes that you work on, whether that's transit, highway, or something else. Uh, because I anticipate a number of rulemakings coming out with IIJA, and you'll have the opportunity to comment, and your comment becomes part of the public record, and it's it's part of the conversation. Thank Lou, you. have you had Thank experience you. with that type? Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Um, so we we did go through that um, as as he 
as you mentioned, um, the law did come out in 2012. And then there's a notice of proposed rulemaking and then proposed rulemaking. Throughout the entire time, um, we were able to provide input into that process, which then became came out in the final, final rule. And so that is absolutely true. Um, actually, there's another piece in there. If, uh, if anyone's interested, there was a systems guidebook that was put out. So it seems like it seems like the Federal Transit Administration or USDOT oftentimes puts out guidance and then the guidance shows up in the law and then the law becomes the rule and then then we follow those things. So um, one of the one of the the experience we've had is if we look to the guidance as likely what we can expect, then we start kind of paddling before the wave gets here. Um, that gives us runway to be ready as an organization when those rules come out. Um, but yeah, we, we have been involved and have made comments. And I would just add that our experience has been the, the regulators, the, the USDOT, the FTA, whoever it is, they're very receptive and open to the experiences that we have and understanding our, both our challenges and our desires. Excellent. Mildred, you must have, uh, thank you, Lou. You must have had some experience in that also. Yes. I mean, I mean, just to piggyback off of what Lou had said, I mean, that systems guidebook is a perfect example. We're in when that first came out and they were soliciting uh, volunteers, right, or for organizations to join and develop this guidebook. I mean, we saw that as a challenge internally in New York. And so we signed up and said, yes, we will be part of this uh, development of the guidance, understanding that it will help in the future as it becomes part of legislation, you know, eventually. Um, so that was, uh, I know yeah, RTD was part of that as well. And we worked in the same team with uh, Jacobs. Excellent. So thank you. Uh, uh, Ian, you've been uh, patient. Uh, uh, I think what you were going to comment on is is long past, but uh, what what were you going to say? Well, lots lots of really good discussions and so many different angles we could go on. But there was a couple of things that came up that I just wanted to chat to, like uh, both Mildred and David and, and Michael were all kind of talking the same the same kind of things. But I just wanted to make sure it was like hitting home as a point was that this is a, a cross organization effort. You know, like this isn't led by like one like this, this isn't all done within one silo in an organization. We truly have to work across the organization with finance, with engineering, with ops, with planning, like it has to be done together. And I think that that's coming through in the discussions, but I just wanted to make sure that was that was coming out loud and clear. Um, on, on the training front um, and funding of the training, something that's happened in Canada. Um, so we have a gas tax fund as well. So skimming money off, uh, of gas pro gasoline products uh, to go back into infrastructure. And recently uh, the legislation around that was actually changed to allow uh, infrastructure owners to use it, not just for capital projects, but also for training and capacity building. Um, and that it, a lot of them are still using it for the infrastructure dollars and the spending, but at least it's opened that door for, for any of them that want to use it for that. So the MAP 21 was a major funding bill and there was a million dollars for training. Uh, of the hundreds of million dollars that were in it, it's, it wasn't much, but it was used very well from what I understand. And I hope the GAO does a study on how the funding for the training went, but uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to do that. Uh, ben, you've had your hand up. Yeah, thanks. I was just going to make a comment on some of the prioritization and how in Australia we have sort of moved. So more like a what, what's possible down the line is we actually look engage with our communities on our asset management plans. Um, and that helps to shape our prioritization in terms of what assets. So from an engineering perspective, we'll look at you know condition, function, capacity, and the likes and those things. But then when we speak with our community, it's understanding what they what they want and what they're willing to pay for. So are they do they want to have roads that are, you know, a condition one or two, or are they happy to let some of their roads go down to a to a poor condition? So it's really asking them what are they willing to pay for, which then helps to shape how we prioritize our spend and where we need to invest. You know, and what we're finding is you if you ask them, 
what do you want versus what are you willing to pay for? It changes the responses you get because if you ask them what do they want, they want the gold standard of everything. But when you ask them what are you willing to pay for, okay, now now the now the conversation really opens up around well, actually we're we're happy to let some of these things deteriorate a bit further because we don't want to pay for that. And we also look at things like where are they located. So if I take a, a pathway for example, if that's located near a an older an old folks home, a school, a shopping center, we're obviously going to put that a higher prioritization weighting on that rather than a, a pathway that's in a small local road in a back street that has minimal use. So it's really understanding that that function, what is it doing and where is it located to help shape how we spend our investment. And then obviously climate is a huge impact on that as well. You know, looking at um, Amelia mentioned about sea level rise. So for us, it's about looking forward and going, well, a building's due for a mule that's close to a to the to the ocean. Should we actually look at relocating that back to future proof and build some climate resilience into our assets to make sure that in 30 years if sea levels rise, that asset's not going to be impacted. Thank you, Ben. Giving a little quiet pause there. We don't have to be talking the entire time. People can let some of this sink in. No, absolutely, Ben. That's uh, absolutely uh, exactly along the lines of what we're thinking. There's uh, a comment there from Cecilia in the chat. You know, what happens when communities are unable to pay you know, we're, we're seeing in Canada, like some communities are actually having to stop delivering some services because we can't afford to deliver it. And, you know, I, I've seen so many communities are kind of stretching and stretching and there's no tax increases and there's no rate increases and they're still trying to provide the same levels of service, which are getting more and more expensive to deliver. At some point, things crack and things break and you have to decide whether you're going to keep going that service or not. And I think that's a big power around asset management is we can have those discussions in a meaningful and transparent way with the public around what we can and can't afford slash what they're willing to pay for and what they're not willing to pay for. Um, you know, I think this idea that we can keep on delivering amazing services and taxes can come down at the same time is, uh, is uh, some sort of magic that, uh, that, isn't, that isn't really around. I just, um, can I just comment? Amelia's made a comment around where does the issue of equity come in? Yeah. So I've worked in some um, local governments that have a really low socioeconomic um, areas with, min, uh, but then on the flip side, they've got some really um, high um, economic areas within one within the one local government area. And so the equity comes in around using the science rather than having the person make the decision based on the location it's using the science so is the function there is the capacity there and, and removing where its actual physical location is other than for some climate things and looking at what's the intent what are we trying to provide to the community and it's important to make sure that all the community has access to you know infrastructure that that they need so sometimes you know lower socioeconomic the type of infrastructure you provide is different based on their needs and then in the other areas, you provide some, an alternative because they don't need this. They've got different requirements. So that, that's how we deal with equity. Um, I wanted to, um, I, I'm, I'm conscious about time. Um, we wanted to ask um, Lou if he could just talk a little bit about a book that he's writing with Ruth Walsgrove from AMCL on asset leadership. Uh, I think this would be a perfect way to sort of tie everything together to the theme of, of what we're talking about, which is asset leadership. All right. Well, um, wasn't wasn't quite ready for that, but uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. We like to ask um, one pop question every. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe just a preview, Lou, if you're not ready. Okay. So, um, so yes, uh, it's it's interesting that um, these themes this this um, leadership in asset management it's it's around asking the right questions we have to start thinking about future friendly assets we have to be able to provide the essential services that assets deliver without stealing from the future um, and 
this uh, so this kind of builds on some previous work we did on building an asset management team, which really talks a lot about the the knowledge, skills, and ability of the people that we need to be able to deliver better asset management. Um, so the next level there is then if you're an infrastructure leader, what are the critical things that you need to know and be focused on? What are the questions we need to ask? How do we start to look at these trade-offs and the, the, um, the opportunity costs that we're, that we're, that we're dealing with? Uh, again, I should have had a really nice, clean, canned uh, message for this, um, but I don't. Um, well, sorry, sorry for the pop question. No, no, yes. no. But we're 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 writing about exactly this. It's the leadership. It's it's thinking longer term. It's embodying the the philosophy and the principles, and being able to help leaders understand what their role is in infrastructure management. And, and may I add, though, that the first book um, that that you guys wrote was very helpful, at least from our perspective. I mean, we used it at the MTA as we were trying to understand how we would wanna redesign the organization to be more um, capable, right? Moving forward uh, with asset management. So I just I just wanted to like, you know, kudos to you guys because that first book was really very helpful. If anyone has not seen it, re read it, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very good, it focuses on sort of your experience at RTD, but so applicable, at least in a public transit perspective. And it was very helpful for us um, during a transformation um, process. So um, thank you so much. And I'm so excited to see that this the second uh, book is, uh, you know, in the works about leadership, because I think that's a great uh, companion to building an asset management organization. The next piece would be leadership. So thank you. We're looking forward to it. Thanks, Mildred. I had the privilege of talking with everyone uh, before the event, uh, and uh, David was telling me about the allocation of $800 billion for water, which sounds like, wow, that's great. But uh, David, will you talk about the real implications of that? Um, yeah, well, I, I think, well, there's a, a couple comments if I if I can steal. Sure, and, first. And, and I, I, I want to respond to, to, to Ben's comment and how Absolutely, I agree with that. In that, you know, with, with some of the digital solutions, and I, I'm going to kind of put on my 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 day job hat, uh, working for Innovise now now Autodesk. More of my view on that, as opposed to the American Society of Civil Engineers, just because I I don't get to speak on that part of it. But the 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 our digital solutions to this day, you know, there's lots of data sets that help us bring value into the prioritization that kind of I, I, well, a touchy subject kind of normalize this is about equity right but we have amazing pieces of information and organizations that specialize in you know like the cdc with their social vulnerability index or the united way folks out of new jersey with their alice indices that really help try to you know bring a quantitative aspect to equity and and if we're if we really are in asset management about optimizing value, you know what better way than to invest in these disadvantaged communities, right? Because they see almost the most value for any given dollar in in some of these infrastructure spend that that they just haven't seen. And so there's there's some amazing tools to this day that allow us, you know, to to kind of take that very complicated subject and. <clears throat> bring a sense of, you know, prioritization to it. Now, talking about the, you know, the infrastructure bill and such, you know, we're all, we're all excited uh, to, to see this amount of funding. And I think very specific in water, 55 billion. Okay, great. And, and that's amazing start. And that's over, you know, what we think is like the next 10 years, but, you know, we, we kind of have this $80 billion identified gap. <laughs> um, you know, and that grows, you know, and continues every year. So we still need, we still know that while this tremendous funding is a, is a great boost um, to our infrastructure need and our, our economy, there's still more need than funding. And so we, we have to prioritize, we have to 
to make sure every single dollar we spend is the best dollar we spend. So, you know, Amelia, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're there watching these projects because, you know, we've, we, we just, we're just scratching, you know, the bucket here, right? And, and so, you know, asset management principles, prioritization, bringing digital kind of analytics, um, you know, into the equation to say, how can we kind of, you know, discharge these very emotional subjects with, with science and, 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 and organizations better than we could ever be that are, are in the communities understanding what the plight of some of these disadvantaged communities are to bring that data to the table so we can make good decisions for our community. Um, it, it's just prioritization is going to be key and we, we have to, to be able to take a, a very, I was going to say objective, but bringing in some very emotionally charged subjective topics into our prioritization. I would like to say that uh, Ben comes to us uh, through our new member, Aesthetic, which is also a software company, David. ISO 55001 7.5 says you shall have an information management system. So we do need to talk about that. And uh, Ben has uh, used uh, uh, that software. Uh, I don't know if you have any further comments on the use of software, Ben. Uh, I think the, the use of software just really enables us to make the decisions faster. So, you know, we've got software that helps us with our optimization. So, you know, we could, sure, we could do it through spreadsheets and the like, but the software is really <laughs> what power and it powers us to really make those decisions faster. I look at the software as the enabler. So we still need all of those processes, people, cultures in place, and the software really sits on that and just enables us to make those decisions. But, you know, you find that having a good asset management information system is going to really allow from a, you know, data decision-making maintenance perspective, it really allows us to better understand our assets. You know, we, we look at historic maintenance data now to help inform our our decisions in terms of how we're prioritizing assets. If we've got assets that have had significant maintenance spend over the last five years, well, maybe there's a need to go and do a renewal on this asset rather than continuing to just spend maintenance on it over and over again. Maybe there's something that needs to be investigated and looked at to, to generate that. And that's only able to be done by having that information in a repository somewhere that can be accessed, sliced and diced, and display to the to the relevant people, whether it be the accountant saying we need more money or we need to do this, or whether it's to the engineers to enable them to say, okay, there's an issue here. So that's what the I see the value of the software is really is that enabler. So maybe in uh, the uh, hearings about rules, uh, we can also mention training and software um, as areas to be spending money on. So we probably have enough time for people to make a final uh, statement or comment or to ask any of the other panelists, or the roundtable members, if uh, for other questions. So why don't we go in the same order that we did uh, to start, Amelia? Well, this has been really interesting. I think it's been a, a great group of people, different perspectives, uh, federal, state and local consulting firms and Great to have Australia here represented as well. Uh, I'll just- Canada too, Canada. Uh, yes, Canada, Canada, of course. Canada, you know, in our, in our report where we established the asset management framework, we studied Canada and uh, Canada was a great example for us. Uh, we also studied Australia for our climate report uh, so um, it's just been very interesting. And uh, in our asset management framework, you know, the principles were taking a portfolio wide approach, prioritizing, of course, leadership, but looking at the entire structure of an organization, performance measurement, looking at outcomes, having good quality data. And those are the things that will be needed in spending this huge sum of money. Uh, I see Erica, Erica putting in a comment. Yes, we met with Erica. That was a great, we had a great trip in Canada. We saw it, we got to see lots of projects. 
Um, so those principles that we came up with in our asset management framework are the principles that will need to be applied uh, in spending this $550 billion uh, across the infrastructure assets in the United States. Thank you very much, Amelia. David? Uh, yeah, I just want to reiterate that, you know, our, our next generation uh, civil engineer is, is not going to be just, you know, a design engineer. They need to be uh, wear multiple hats. And, and we have to, you know, not be afraid um, anymore of, of understanding this, this holistic environment that we're in, right? We have to, we have to kind of take a look and understand the interrelationships between public infrastructure, public safety, public health. Um, and, and as we're starting to look at things such as, you know, access to affordable water as a human right, what does that mean, right? And, and, and be able to bring these, again, very emotionally charged subjects into the conversation just because we've, we've almost, you know, uh, kind of thought as, I think, as engineers, oh, that's too difficult. That's that human thing. You know, I'd rather deal with pipes and asphalt and bridges, you know, and, and what are assets, you know, they, they have intended purpose, right? If there's no, if there's no people, there's no assets, right? So, so we, we have to take that into account and just not be afraid to have these conversations anymore. Jim Dieter is applauding you for saying that. That's uh, his, uh, one of his things also. Uh, Lou? Well, thanks for your time today. I want to say, of course, thanks to my team who um, does a lot of this. I really do think that one of the key messages I want to leave is that right, if we're going to be leaders in asset management, we, we have to, in order for us to influence the C-suite, we have to remind them of their responsibilities and we have to be able to articulate that need to focus. And we, so one of the, one of the analogies I use sometimes is firefighters and fire marshals. Um, it's really easy to get sucked into the emergency, um, and we we need to be um, less reactive. We need to not be emotional, and we need to approach things very um, rationally. And as hard as it sounds, sometimes we need to be able to sit across the street from a building burning, a burning building, and kind of think, okay, what could we have done to prevent that from happening? And then what what can we do now? so that five years in the future, these things don't happen again. Um, it's, it's really this idea that we have to be thinking long-term. We have to be doing, if we're not doing the long-term thinking and the long-term planning, then no one's doing it. So that's where people really need us. They need us to focus on those things that it's too easy to get sucked into emergencies. Um, there are lots of people who do that, who are good at that. Um, we, need, we need people who are really good at thinking um, that longer term. Um, this is the book that uh, Mildred mentioned. If anyone is interested in a copy, if you send me an email, I'll uh, send you a, a link to the PDF copy. So that's it. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Lou. And uh, we plan on reeling you in uh, for more comments in the future. We really appreciate your contribution today. Uh, Ian? Uh, yeah, I mean, my kind of closing thought is, is really all about the, the people side of this and the competency side of it. Like, are we ready as organizations to, uh, to be doing this in terms of the, the asset management side and the skills that we need and the, the time and the, and the resources that we have at a people level? So we can get the money released at a federal level or a state level in terms of, yeah, we want to increase our infrastructure funding. But how do we, how do we make sure that organizations have um, the time and skills to, to be able to, to make those better decisions and put those plans into action, you know, develop your asset management plans, have those discussions with your stakeholders. Like those are, uh, are things that we need to be uh, mindful of. So yeah, that's a uh, cl closing thought for me. Great. Thank you. And uh, also Ian, uh, we're looking to more, uh, looking forward to more information from you in the future. Ben. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, it's really exciting to see, um, you know, the, the US and organizations like the ALN really driving asset management, the impact that that's going to have on communities long term is going to be, be huge. So I, I applaud you guys for really making an effort. I think one key takeaway for me is the importance in asset management of bringing the engineers and the accountants together 
So what I like to refer to as accountaineering. So <laughs> it's, it, it's no longer an engineer's problem and it's not an, a finance problem. It's a really a, a asset manager is a, the combination of the two and obviously some other parts of the business. So if you can bring those two together and I think in terms of an engineer skill set moving forward, it's really about being able to take hard data and formulating a story that can be told to the accountants to the community to really explain why we need to do it, what we're doing. And, and that's how you're going to get your spend. That's how you're going to get buy-in from the communities is by really telling that story of your assets in a way that people understand, not with numbers and just data. That, that doesn't, you need to make it exciting and really you know, make asset management sexy for everyone. Great, thank you. So Mildred, you have the tough job. So finally closing it. Yeah, no, what did thanks. you think of all this? It is fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, everyone talked about asset management from very different perspectives, but what that really tells us is that asset management reaches every perspective and we need to work together in a collaborative manner to make sure that we advance um, the principles of asset management. It's people, it's process, it's technology, it's data. And the hope is infrastructure funding, you know, when we fund projects, we need to look for a way to also get some of the other aspects of asset management also funded because they are intricately connected to the actual build projects um, that are going to be let out very soon. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, uh, Michael Demers had to drop off at the top of the hour, so uh, he was not able to make a final statement. And I forgot to mention at the beginning of the hour that uh, Peter Dojian from the uh, Army Corps of Engineers was not able to attend. So uh, he extends his apologies. And we plan on having future events on this very important topic of bringing a leadership perspective to the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And so uh, he'll definitely be involved. And uh, related to that, I want to uh, make a couple plugs. We are talking Thursday at uh, three with Rich Culbertson. He's an ALN senior fellow and an ALN board of directors member who lives in Pittsburgh. And the bridge that collapsed also had a gas pipeline that went across it. So we do have to look at assets holistically because the bridge goes down and then suddenly people don't have heat for their homes. Um, and uh, Rich's daughter lives near that bridge and she and her husband walk under it. There is a uh, path in the ravine and this is a very personal issue and we need to make this personal to everyone. So that'll be Thursday. And then uh, through Aesthetic, uh, Aesthetic, the uh, company that introduced us to Ben Clark, there will be a program on March uh, 8th uh, uh, on the Greater, uh, Greater Galang, the city of Greater Galang, Australia, which has had a, a very uh, wonderful asset management story. And that will be a predecessor to March 15th and 16th, where we're going to be having an asset uh, 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 leadership network uh, summit on uh, infrastructure and value. And so there are things that are coming up. Uh, put those dates on your calendar. We'll have more specifics uh, coming forward. Um, I uh, want to thank all of our, uh, our guests. Uh, thank you so much for attending uh, and participating in this. And here they are again. Um, and uh, also want to thank uh, our patron sponsors, our organizational members. And thank you, Nick, for uh, taking care of all the uh, details of the technology. And uh, uh, also uh, thanks to Jim Dieter, our fearless uh, uh, CEO who uh, guides uh, our forward thinking on all of this. Uh, really appreciate his influence in this. Thank you all. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.